Hi, I am Chef Sabi. I've been a Madison restaurateur for 20 years. Join me as I cook my way around the world and visit with Madison area chefs to explore their culinary creations. Come with me on an epic journey of culinary adventures, right here on Cooking the Casbah. Over here, welcome to Cooking the Casbah. My name is Sabi. I take you on a culinary journey of the Mediterranean and the world, right here in Madison. Today, Native American cooking. And it brings me pleasure to introduce to you Kane Goulet, who is uh, Native American and will be sharing with you some of his ancient recipes. Before we start, I want you to know every episode of Cooking the Casbah is often pretty much assembled by Kane with my help, of course. Or who's help? Who's helping whom? Anyway, without further delay, Kane Goulet. Show me what you're making. Thank you, Chef Savi. I'm going to start off with the old family recipe some chicken and wild rice soup. It's a great replacement for your classic chicken and noodles. Somebody's sick, you just need to get warmed up. It's the fall time, so we'll do that. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of olive oil in the pan. We're going to saute the onions and the carrots to begin. This just brings out some of the sugars and flavors out of the onions and carrots to help complement the chicken. I'm gonna brown these a little bit. Now, traditional native food is not real well seasoned because the natural flavors came from the food. I am gonna add, however, some fresh ground black pepper. Genius, genius. This is delicious. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, I also add one clove and one bay leaf. And while these are browning, we can talk about the wild rice. This is traditional white earth wild rice grown by actually family that I have up north in Minnesota. And with wild rice, whenever you're cooking with it, you'd want to rinse it at least three or four times or until when you dump the water off, it's clear. And also a fact about rice, wild rice, is that it's not actually a rice. It is a seed from a grass. And it puffs up just the same. I have here two cups of wild rice that I pre-cooked. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour if you don't soak it beforehand. For our purposes, I did. Now my onions and everything are starting to look very pretty, so I'm gonna add about a cup of chicken, cup and a half, and I'm gonna cook that up until that's all the way finished before I add anything else. This recipe was given to me by my mother, Karen, who got it from her mother and probably a couple generations after that, but I'm taking credit for it. Now, I also want to add a tablespoon of oregano and a lot of TLC. Now, the traditional Ojibwe word for rice is manomen, which means for food that grows on the water. Very literal translation. A lot of food grows on the water. Yeah, but this is the only manome. Ducks. <laughs> <laughs> now wild rice is one of my favorite dishes. And the process in which they did it is still done in its traditional way up north. They go out in the canoes, they actually bend the grass over the boat and paddle it. The rice falls in, they wear blankets, and then when they come back to shore, they have the children of what would have been the tribes back then. Now you've still got the tribes, slightly more modern communities. And they actually walk back and forth on the rice to break off the shells. And then that's sorted through to give us what we've got here today. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So once the chicken is almost all the way cooked, I'm going to add about six cups of water which might seem like a lot for only two cups of rice, but it will all be absorbed by the rice. At this stage, I'm also going to add a cup of tomato paste. And about a tablespoon or so of salt. And mix all those in. I'm going to let this come to a boil. 
Now, like I said, I pre-cooked this wild rice about a half an hour. So you don't need to cook it as long once it's added. If you do so, you can also just rinse and add directly. You would then have to cook everything together for about 45 minutes, a half an hour. Delicious, either way. Now that it's boiling, I'm going to add this pre-cooked rice. Since I pre-cooked the rice, I'm only going to have to let it simmer now for maybe 15 minutes and it will be ready to serve. So I'm going to stir this a wee bit. And at this stage, once the rice is pretty much finished, I'm going to add a cup and a half of mushrooms. Any mushroom you like is good. I'm using portobellas because they're the most convenient at this point in time. And also some fresh diced tomatoes because fresh always adds a nice touch of flavor to whatever you're doing. So I'm going to stir these in, cover, and let simmer for about 15 minutes and we'll be ready to eat. When we come back, we'll serve up the soup and he has something else up his sleeve. So stay tuned and you're watching Cooking the Casbah, Native American Cooking. Hello. Welcome back to Cooking the Casbah with me, Chef Kane. That's right, I stole the show for the day. But don't worry, I will be giving it back to Chef Sabi before it's all said and done. Now, before the show, I prepared a chicken and wild rice soup, traditional for my family. Many fall nights, I warm myself with this. So we take this with the mushrooms, tomatoes, carrots, everything like that, and the bay leaf. And to garnish this soup, as you can see, most of the water was absorbed by the rice. This makes it a very thick and filling soup and also very healthy. And to simply garnish, a few leaves of cilantro, nice little squeeze of lime, and you're ready to warm up. I think you should give that one to your mom. Now, while everyone is finishing this delicious chicken and wild rice soup, I'm going to start with the next dish, which is a fruited buffalo. Traditionally, back in the day, my ancestors would use fruit to tenderize their meat because they didn't have all of the fancy ingredients we use now. Now this I would like to show, because I am dealing with buffalo, I would like to point out that buffalo is a much leaner meat than your average bovine. You can tell here by the fact that this is the cow, much more marbled with fat, and this is the buffalo, a much more solid piece of meat. You can tell the difference pretty easily, I think, between one and the other. And what this does is the fact that this meat is a much thicker meat, A, you don't need as much to fill you up, and B, when you cook it, you don't lose as much of the weight as you did before. So, you also need to cook this meat much slower at a much lower temperature. Even if you want a medium rare cut, it is better, although traditionally with red meat, if you want a medium rare cut, you would want to cook it at a high heat for a short period of time. Buffalo just gets a lot tougher if you cook it that way. So I'm going to start off by sauteing the onions and the garlic. Onions, garlic. Mm -mm. Smells good. <clears throat> we'll get those going. A little pinch of salt in there with it never hurts. And while those are cooking up, I'm going to start mixing the rest of the ingredients. Whoa, got all crazy there with the onions. To start, we take one cup of milk and we mix in some breadcrumbs as much as you feel necessary. And you just mix them in and then squeeze them pretty dry and set them aside for a little bit later. 
because this dish is going to be baked. And what this does is allows the bread to get crispy and still stay nice and moist on the center. Because you love it when it's juicy on the center. To the milk, we're going to want to add one egg white, a teaspoon or so of cumin and coriander, and a half a teaspoon of cayenne. You can change that depending on how spicy you like food. Seeing as how we're here in the Midwest, I'm going to keep the spice down a little less. <laughs> and then to that, you'll add our berries, which will naturally tenderize the meat as we cook it. So I chose to use cherries and blueberries because I love cherries and blueberries. You can use any fruit you want. You want to use about a half a cup to three quarters of a cup of berries in with this mixture. And we also add a quarter cup of roasted pine nuts and about three tablespoons of lemon juice. And then you just add directly to that the raw buffalo. I cut this very small so that it can cook. You can also use ground buffalo if you like. And if buffalo is not readily available to you, you can use cow. Tisk, tisk, tisk. But the flavor of buffalo is just so delicious. I don't know why you would want to. So we get this mixed in pretty well. And then wash our hands because it is raw meat. Sabi taught me that one. <laughs> so now my onions are all ready and prepared. So I just mix those right in with everything. I love onions. And then we'll add the breadcrumbs right back in. I took them out originally so that they would not become all too mushy. Now everything else in here allows it to I'd be too much. And you want to thoroughly mix all of this. And then I portion it out. I've got here four different ramekins. This recipe calls for seven ounce containers. You can do it however large as portions you want. Just remember that the thicker the portion, the longer you're going to have to cook it. As I said earlier, with buffalo, it's always better to be at a low temperature for a longer period of time. It allows to make sure that the buffalo stays nice and tender so that everyone compliments you, loves you, and begs you to come back again. Or you just beg yourself to cook again, wherever works for you. So I'm going to cook these for 45 minutes to an hour at only about 300, 310 degrees, which will ensure that they are cooked through and through, but not all tough and chewy, because no one likes chewy meat. And then I just place these onto a sheet pan, as is, directly on the oven. But when you're cooking several at a time, it's easier to do on this. 300, 310 degrees, 45 minutes to one hour. Pop them into the magical oven. And this is what they look like. Very easy dish, quick, well, not so quick, but very simple. Garnish with a bit of parsley. And if you serve this with a, bread, a bed of just your classic rice or wild rice, you have a delicious Native American feast that one can prepare by oneself for anyone, anytime. Delicious. That's all I have for you. Thank you, Kane. That was Kane Goulet, my right-hand man. He is often behind the scenes at Cook in the Casbah, and today he took over center stage. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, we'll continue with our Native American feast, where I attempt, I say attempt, to make a Native American dish influenced by Mediterranean flavors. So stay tuned.